In spite of what the graduation speakers say every spring, our town's pretty average. It goes for our seats, too. Out of this class of 40, just because it is average, two of these boys and girls will spend some part of their lives in a mental institution. My job is to try to keep the people around here healthy, and most of them are. Of course, nobody's health is ever perfect. Jim Anderson has a bad ear. But that doesn't keep him from playing on the football team. County champions last year, too. Frank White is nearsighted, but his glasses take care of that. Dorothy Westerly has a tooth that needs fixing, but she's in good health, I'd say. Mighty good health. They've all learned habits of good living that have helped them stay physically healthy. Habits of cleanliness, good diet, exercise, and rest. But there's another side to good health, and that's good mental health. One in four Bridgeton adults experience at least one diagnosable mental health problem in a year. And it's estimated that approximately 450 million people worldwide have some form of mental illness. That's around 300 out of 1,000 that will experience this every year in the UK. Out of this 300, 230 will visit their GP. 102 of these people will be diagnosed as having a mental health problem. 24 of these will be referred to a psychiatric service and six will become inpatients in psychiatric hospitals. You probably know a few people who suffer from some form of mental illness, whether you realize it or not. You'll probably find out somebody in your family has. You will definitely find that a large number of big names from the film and TV shows that you watch have suffered or do suffer. And a small number of these big names have lost their battle, whether it be indirectly or directly, with that form of mental illness. When the media picks up on somebody in the limelight having a mental breakdown, are they given support and understanding? No, they are not. They are glamorised by some and mocked by many. My name is Luke Mordew, and I have suffered from depression and anxiety since I was a little boy. I cannot recall a time I felt content or genuinely happy. Over the years, I tried hard to overcompensate. All of my energy went into coming across as carefree and as happy as I could be. In the spring of 2013, I was going to kill myself. I won't go into details, but I nearly did it. I saw no hope and no future that I could be happy in. But I stopped, and I didn't go through with it, and I found my hope. And so I am making this documentary about the perception of mental illness, and why we don't all just cheer the fuck up. No one understood why I was being the way I was. Um, I was isolating myself. Um, I wasn't able to have a good time. So no one really understood because they didn't know what was going on in my head. Um, it was only when I went to the doctor and I just told him that I'm just tired all the time. And he basically said, well, there's nothing physically wrong with you. So what else is going on? Then I had a session and he diagnosed me and I was able to tell my family and they were extremely supportive. Um, and just comforted me in, in every way that they could and allowed me to go through each emotion that I needed to go through. For somebody to be diagnosed with depression, I mean, for, to be sort of medically sort of technical about it, to actually get a diagnosis, you'd have to have a sort of low mood and um, a series of other sort of symptoms, for example, poor sleep, uh, poor concentration, um, disturbance in your appetite... I think they actually diagnose it now of having those symptoms every day for two weeks. That that's basically what they would base the, sort of the diagnosis on when they're sort of looking back over someone's uh, presentation. That's when they would actually diagnose it as a classic depression, because otherwise, it's, um, you know, people are saying about low mood, just feeling a bit off colour. But to actually say this is depression, you'd have to have those sort of set of symptoms or some of those symptoms for at least two weeks for a doctor or a psychiatrist to diagnose it.
I've had it as long as I can remember, depression. Um, only when I was a child, I didn't really obviously quite understand what it was. As I kind of grew up, I escaped, I tried to escape it by doing what I do, which is music and art, and now I'm into sound engineering. And I feel that that actually was attempting to escape from it, to, as, as my counsellor once said, sort of searching for the light, as it were. Um, and when I hit 40, once that came to an end, I was just left with the kind of depression, really. So you sort of, and I had a breakdown at that point, whatever that means, but it was like physical and mental breakdown um, with anxiety attacks and panic attacks and um, actually be quite unwell, some voices and, you know, a few things that went on at that time. And that's when I started medication at that time, which has helped. My name is Mary York, and 30 years ago, my husband committed suicide. Brian went missing for two days, and I had no idea where he was, and the rest of the family, we were all rather panicked. And then the hospital in um, Stratford-upon-Avon phoned me to say they had had him there. He was in a hotel, and there he took an overdose. He was a diabetic, and he took an overdose of insulin. That the front, our front room was his music room and he liked to listen to music. So he would take himself off in there a lot more and I thought he was harbouring. But I knew there was problems at work so I thought he was harbouring a lot of that and he probably was. But uh, not, you know, suicidal thoughts, but he was, that's all. Yeah. But it just goes to show how, you know, the depressives can keep this secret. Tim, my son, he was two, and I had, I thought I was gonna be homeless. And I had my other two children with me, so it was three children to care for, and with knowing the extent of our finances, I thought we were gonna be homeless. So I was really angry, because he hadn't told me. I felt, and so did we all, as well as his colleagues, that it wasn't, it should have been more a more, should have been more to have committed suicide, to have taken his own life. We felt it wasn't enough to have taken his own life. It, you know, it should have been more devastation for him, but he obviously felt that that's, but I do feel that it was something that he did on impulse because none of us had noticed any depression. Anxiety would be more, I would, I'd say it's probably more an over, overreaction to something that other, so you, so say you have a quite a stressful event, you would then have a normal stress reaction to it. So say, for example, you've got a driving test coming up, there would be an expectation that people would experience some sort of level of anxiety. If that level of anxiety were carried on after the event or was out of proportion to the event then I think that's when they would actually look at it being more of a sort of a, 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 an unusual sort of level of anxiety that they would then look at as possibly being um, out, out of the norm sort of thing and obviously as with depression with anxiety there's sort of sliding scales so it could be just a slight sort of stress like worry to panic attacks and you know agoraphobia post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think it would be a sort of abnormal reaction to a potential sort of stressful event but that would carry on beyond um, the event. You look at everyone else around you and they seem to be very much in control of their lives and they seem to have everything in order and you just feel like the odd one out. Um, but that's just a facade, I think. Um, people don't really show how they feel. So you just constantly feel like an outsider when you're not feeling okay. With friends, it, I pick and choose who I tell. 
Um, some people don't know, other people do know, and they're usually people that suffer with depression or something like that anyway. So um, generally, I think um, people find it uh, difficult if, if you choose to to talk about it, you, you quickly know the people that um, don't really want to hear it, and uh, so you, you you don't mention it anymore. Um, others that do understand, you can talk to. So it depends on the individual really whether or not they um, feel comfortable with it. So I don't make pe people feel uncomfortable about it, so I don't I don't mention it. I, I think there's just a fear. I think it's, it's it's there's a huge sort of fear factor. It's the great unknown, and I think because you can't see it people are quite fearful of it. I think, you know, with somebody that's got a broken leg or broken arm or, you know, um, you, you can see that it's visual. You can then make, you, you can, you've got a bit of a warning. I, I feel constantly fatigued in terms of physical yeah. things, um, especially since the breakdown. I had like a kind of a complete physical breakdown as well. So it was like, uh, which they call chronic fatigue. So that's always there, really. Um, and I manage that by sort of trying to exercise and trying to do certain things that, you know, you think will help. And I, I don't seem to get the panic attacks so much. The medication has definitely helped with the panic attacks, although I do feel, I suppose, um, uncomfortable in situations that maybe other people wouldn't. So, you know, meeting people or things like that, I can feel really quite anxious. Um, but, but again, I've learned to manage that, I suppose. The treatments for depression and anxiety are quite similar, really, um, and, and things have moved on a lot for most people once they've been on their medication. Um, after sort of two or three weeks, most people do actually start to feel a benefit from it. But it isn't just medication. I mean, for some people, they don't really need medication. It can be talking therapies, CBT, cognitive behavioural therapy, which is again very current. But yeah, medication has its place. I think we've moved away a little bit more from just purely seeing medication as the be-all and the end-all to, to, to treatment for depression and anxiety. And I think that it has its place. I, I'm not saying it doesn't, but I think there are certainly other things that we need to be looking at as well, maybe to work alongside or instead of. I, I would like to think it's people can feel quite open about mental health and feel like they won't be judged. But I think people are a lot more open about it. Um, it's a lot more easy to discuss. But I, th I think it's, uh, it's something sometimes you don't even think about unless you've had it yourself. Um, I think it's improved a lot. Like We're not locking people up for just being a little bit sad anymore. Um, but I still think there's a lot more that could be done. I don't think people get the right treatment and I don't think people I think people judge other people unfairly for just being unwell. I'm from France, and in France we take a, uh, we take a lot of we take a lot of happy pills, and we're not ashamed about it, you know. And no, I still feel that there could be more done about it. I still feel that there's this whole social, you know, stigma. view about it. It's, yeah, stigma about it. It's not understood fully. I think people don't understand it as much as what they should. But I think people just don't understand what it's about if they haven't been through it, or they don't know anybody who's been through it. I think it's difficult for people to understand it. It's not like broken arms and broken legs where you can actually see it. Uh, it's something that's very much hidden. Yeah, I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think it's all right nowadays. Yeah, it's not as bad. It's a little bit more work, but it's got better. Yeah. Because I just think it's horrible that people don't feel they can tell other people that they're ill because they feel like they'll be judged for it. I think that's really unfair. What I'd like to say from the bottom of my heart is that it's really terrible to have those feelings of anxiety and panic and negative thoughts constantly running through your head where you lose belief in yourself, you have low self-esteem, you lose your confidence. Um, and I was always a very confident person and I always had very high self-esteem was always very sure of myself. So when it hit me, I didn't know who I was anymore. And I had to find myself again. And I hate knowing that there are people going through that, especially at a young age, and they can't get the help and support that they need because they're afraid to speak about it. And that bothers me. 
9% of the world could be diagnosed with depression or anxiety or both and that means 91% of the world wouldn't be able to be, which is great. But 9% to me is still an alarmingly high number and that's never gonna get better unless we get a better understanding of these things. We need people just to, to understand, people to, to people to listen and think about these things and to understand that it's it doesn't make you a weak person. People seem to think that if you suffer from a mental illness, if you're depressed or if you, you're anxious and that it means you're weak. And I want someone to sit and watch this and realize that they're strong too. The fact that they're still here, they're still breathing, that means they haven't given up hope. And it's that hope we're killing on to. There is always hope. And that's what we and that's what it's all about. That's that's really what we all we have left. And there are people out there that want to dismiss this. People out there that say things like, um, oh, you never heard about depression back in the day. It's all bloody new now, isn't it? It's the fashion kind of thing. It's like, no, be, just because you didn't hear about it back then doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I myself have a thyroid condition and it's okay for me to say that, but it's not okay for me to say that I've been depressed or I've had an anxiety disorder. Um, I think there's a lot of shame and stigma attached to it and this needs to change. Is suicide new? Does suicide appear in the 90s? Is that what happened? No, it didn't. Suicide's always been about there. People don't commit suicide because they just can't be bothered. People that commit suicide are at that point where they are completely depressed and falling apart and they have no hope and they can't see anywhere forward to go. 17, 18, young university students, all the way up to men in their 60s, 65, 70s, so and everything in between. So there's just n there isn't one group of people that I would say that, that suffer from depression or anxiety any more than anyone else. It affects, it, across the board, it affects everybody. It's given me a sense of compassion, I think, about other people's problems and things that generally, you know, whatever it may be, what, what people have to deal with. So I, I do try and give as much as I can and my job is very much about that. I love what I do and different people in every day and creating something. And I think that to me is probably, as well as the medication obviously, yeah. is probably one of the biggest things that kind of keeps me, keeps me going and keeps me wanting to keep, you know, face the next day, get up and do something. Our brain, we need that. That's the most important part of our body. It's one of the most fascinating things in the universe. We're fully aware of that. Yet when we've got a problem with our brain, half the world dismiss it. Being able to talk about it, being able to sit there and say, this is how I'm feeling. This is the reason. And even if I didn't know the reason that I'm on the path to discovering out, discovering why I'm feeling this way. Um, and just being able to be honest about it because the more you keep things inside the more it builds up um, and it becomes like some cesspit of darkness be there that's all you need to do just be there if you want to help somebody that has it be there and if you're sat here right now and you're watching this and you're watching this and you feel those sadness you feel that pain inside of you every single day every time when you wake up till you go to bed and you can't get rid of it just remember that you are still alive you are still breathing and you have hope and that that's all that matters because you were getting by and you were fighting and you were a fighter and the reason you wake up every morning and you get out of bed is because that battle you have inside you're winning and sometimes it may be exhausting and you want to just give up but you can't that's just not the way things are that's not the way life works and there's always going to be someone worse off than you. Yeah, there's always somebody out there that is good. There's always someone that's poorer. There's always somebody that's sadder. And if someone says to you, oh, but how can you feel sad? Because there's people out there that are sadder than you. It's like, okay, well, how can you be happy? There's always someone happier than you. That doesn't work. But then they, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense either way. It's easy to dismiss someone for being sad because there's always somebody sadder than that. But then you can flip it on the other way. And suddenly everyone's like, whoa, whoa, you can't do that. But um, I think for sufferers, um, people that actually do suffer from depression and anxiety themselves, if they, I think they're, they're the advocates really, they're the ones that have experienced it, they know what it feels like. I think it's in their hands to go out there and share it really, break down say some of the stigma, some of the barriers and normalise it as I said before, you know, it's, it's nothing to be frightened of. If you could say to someone with a mental illness, just smile or cheer up, then you clearly have no idea what they're going through and you have no idea what they're feeling like. And good, because I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but don't say that to them because you're only gonna make them feel worse because for you to say smile and cheer up is only gonna make them feel like it's their fault even further and it's not their fault. That's the thing.
we live in a very sad world, you know? We live in a, in a world where the information is always there. We've got so much more information and we're so much more intelligent and that's wonderful. But that comes hand in hand with, with a lot more darkness, a lot of dark things that happen come in. Like everyone says the world's, oh, the world's getting so bad. The world isn't getting worse necessarily. You know, those uh, rape, murder and horror stories have always been about, but now we hear them constantly because of the internet and television. And so, although it's not an evil being, it's not an evil thing there, it is a, we are a product of that time we live in. And so we are very sad. We, we've, everyone's poor. We're all getting mixed up. We're all getting messed over by the man. Of course, it's going to be sadness out there. And I'm not saying that people that suffer from mental illness and that their sadness is more important than yours. We all have our problems, we all have our demons. But what all I'm saying is that maybe understand that their demons eat them a bit more. Maybe they need a bit more help than you do. We need a bit of empathy for everybody and every aspect of life. You know, people, people, nobody has time to give sympathy, nobody has time to receive sympathy. But empathy, empathy is the one. If we all had empathy, we'd all be much better off. And I think lots of people get mixed up. People mix empathy and sympathy quite a lot, especially when it comes to mental illness. But maybe, maybe we should just smile, you know? Because uh, frowning is really depressing and it makes people uncomfortable.